some friends and I were eating some MREs that we'd come across, and we determined that what makes an MRE different from regular food is just dousing it in liquid smoke because that's what all of them tasted like. Um, I mean, if you you want to do an MRE segment, I can definitely get Sean for oh, I was you. I say we we have to call Sean in for that one. Yeah, <laughs> he can tell you all about them. The military, even though he's a nice Jew boy, has made him not want to eat brisket, which makes me sad. So I'm going to cook a brisket one of these days to be like, no, see, you can do a good brisket. <laughs> it's a Jew that doesn't eat brisket. It's the weirdest thing. If you make it for Passover, then you can't resist it, right? This is the man that cooked a pork loin on the first night of Hanukkah, though, so. <laughs> That's what the candles are for, to roast a pork chop over. Right? Yes. <laughs> Are you feeling happy and, and motivated enough to do this all over again? Fuck <laughs> my life. Welcome to a Booze and Spirits podcast. It's like a drink with death. That Kate fucks up. <laughs> hey everyone, this is a uh, take two. Uh, I'm Nick McDonald. <laughs> Fuckity fuck 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 nuggets. This is a not safe for work episode. <laughs> uh, we are... This is a re-recording of our original episode because, for some reason, Katie's recording died while we were recording it the first time. So we had a good 40 minutes of footage, two-thirds of the way into the episode at least, when you we know, realized might... none of it was being collected. There might be some great stuff where Nick's talking to himself. 2021 is getting off with a bang. Getting off? Banging off. 2021 is Banging fucking... off? 2021 is fucking me over already. <laughs> Woo! Kate and I have had very different 2021 experiences so far. <laughs> so we may not have our normal <laughs> vin and vigor <laughs> since we've already kind of hashed through a, a lot of our material and our good jokes. So it's all B squad from here on out. <laughs> Maybe it's a chance to refine and make it better. Well, I mean, on the first round, I was real bad at talking when it came to story time, so <laughs> I guess there's that. At this point, I'm just on the fetal position, playing possum. That's a lie. I am a fire sign. I am not going to play possum. I'm just going to drink more and then fight back with a beer bottle. I fight dirty. I gouges. Look at that good transition, though. Yeah, that's right. Fire signs and... Fetal Possums, which would be an awesome punk band name. And uh, fire is the is the topic of the day. We were we discussed. I know we discussed Sex Ghost last time, but we're going to we're going to put that on hold until one of us has sex with a ghost. <laughs> I am trying to put together a uh, personal mission to go investigate Alice Reem's haunted location uh, sometime in the near future. So. Might hold that one off until we actually get a chance to investigate it properly. Instead of just talking about things and reading them online. Yeah, and so instead he's going to take his wife, who doesn't believe in ghosts, on a sex ghost field trip. Where they can have sex with a ghost. For her birthday. There's no, okay. <laughs> There's no evidence that Alice Reem has had sex with a living person. As a ghost. <laughs> 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 There's no, there's no... Enter. Sandman. Enter. Enter. Sand. Enter again faster. I was trying to figure. I was trying to figure out. You know, like interspecies or interracial. What would the, what would you call the interdimensional? Of, maybe it's the spectrum of life and death. Uh, interrectoplasmic. Interrectoplasmic. <laughs> That's <laughs> interrectoplasmic. Damn near killed him. <laughs> Really got to use more lube for that one. <laughs> By the so way, we're do fire stories this week. <laughs> no, welcome no. to it's booze and to booze and spirits podcast. It's like a drink with death. Yay! Are we starting over? I don't this know. This is the show <laughs> that does we... it. End. So my turn. Uh, yeah. Let's let's do your story again. Let's do your story again and better. Bigger, better, faster, funnier. With more words this time. <laughs> so, 
My story is about a potential poltergeist in 1948 in Illinois in a town that I may fuck up the name of. I'm going to go with Macomb, M-A-C-O-M-B. Might be Macomb. It might be Macomb. I don't know, and I'm sorry (laughs) to anyone that uh, feels offended by my mispronunciation of this. This is the uh, Willie family farm. In 1948, they endured hundreds of fires over a two-week span, which destroyed their home two barns, damaged the milk house. The fires began as brown spots on wallpaper, which burst into flames. In the following week, they extinguished more than 200 fires in the home, which wasn't wired for electricity, and at one point, the owner tore down the wallpaper to make sure it wasn't that. Because of these tiny fires in the house, at one point they moved into a tent outside of the house, in which the house then burnt to the ground. So good job them on moving. (laughs) I have the original newspaper story here from the Pittsburgh Press. This uh, ran on August 20th, 1948. There wasn't much left for the mystery fires to destroy on Charlie Willie's farm today. The ghost flames, that's in quotes, you can't see my air quotes because of, you know, the podcasting. (laughs) The ghost flames destroyed the second barn last night. Mr. Willie now has lost his five-room frame cottage, two barns to the fire, which seemed to have come from nowhere. Mrs. Willie said she and her husband were sitting in their yard next to the charred ruins of their home at 6 p.m. when the blaze broke out. I just looked up, and the barn had burst into flames, she said. The barn, which contained hay, burned in 26 minutes. You wouldn't have been able to save it had you been right there with the fire hose, James Peake, a passerby, told Mackham Fireman. The Willies also reported an outbreak of small fires in their milk house. They have lived in the makeshift tent since their house burned last Saturday and used the milk house as a dining room. I know you're saying I know you're saying milk house, but I keep hearing milk cows. They 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 had their dining room in the milk cows. Uh, okay, Mrs. Willie said that she opened the door to the milk house yesterday (laughs) and noticed smoke. She put out a small blaze in shelf paper in a cupboard. Like the other fires which have plagued the willies for two weeks, yesterday's blazes seemed spontaneous. The blazes began two weeks ago when the willies first noticed brown spots on their wallpaper. The spots spread and then burst into flame. The willies doused the fires, but it more appeared, 200 in a week. Finally, the Willies moved out of their home. Saturday, the house burned, and the next day, their first barn went up in flames. Mr. Willie said the wallpaper couldn't be blamed since he had torn it off the walls and the barns weren't papered. Couldn't be defective wiring because the house was not electrified. Mrs. Willie said the family still wasn't frightened by the fires. There must be some natural explanation for them, she said. We're not going to let them lick us. We're still going to rebuild on the foundation of our old home. I like that this story is old enough that they've done troubleshooting to make sure it's not the wallpaper that's doing things. Because this was in an era where some wallpaper manufacturer might make, might print his wallpaper with some kind of chemical. And some wallpaper glue manufacturer might manufacture his glue with some kind of chemical. Those things touch each other and spontaneously combust and nobody bothered to check it beforehand (laughs) yeah so because of these fires and their frequency over the two weeks it got to the point after the first i think couple of days that the neighbors were coming and helping watch the house they were like putting buckets and pails of water all over their house and helping like throw out you know throw the water on the fires to put them out as at least a dozen witnesses saw this happen, including the fire chief. Like, these were just spontaneously erupting fires in the home. It got to the point that the, like, state got involved and the Air Force, which, I mean, I guess it could be something weird the military was doing. Well, that's what it sounds like to me. In 1948? It sounds like a microwave experiment gone awry is what it sounds like. Like somebody trying to figure out that technology and accidentally firing at someone's farmhouse. The, uh, the Air Force officials believe the fires might be caused by radio waves, radioactivity, natural gas, or atomic energy. Whatever that means. <laughs> it's magic. Military magic. But this is uh, currently being considered a poltergeist story because that at the time of the fires, 
Mrs. Wiley's brother and his daughter and son had moved to the farm while the the mother of these children stayed in Bloomington. Apparently, the 12-year-old niece, Juanette McNeil, was very upset about being on the farm. Wait, how old she, did you say? 12. Oh, okay. Her little brother was like 8, I think. She gets the blame for the fires in more than one way. So there is You know, the poltergeist activity here of an angry pubescent, specifically girl, Mm -hmm. setting these fires unintentionally or intentionally. It's hard to say. She was questioned multiple times about this by local authorities and the family, and she kept saying it wasn't her. And then at one point in time, the deputy state fire marshal basically they think took her into a room alone or i think there might have been a local cop there as well i'm sorry it was the district attorney it was the deputy state fire marshal and the district attorney eternity in all eternity to eternity and beyond so the deputy state fire marshal the district attorney got her to confess to setting all these fires and they did it with no other adults present it kind of sounds like they just bullied Juanette into it. It um, sounds like it sounds like the making a murderer kid who just wants to go home and watch wrestling. Pretty <laughs> That's much. What it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, I did it. Can I go home now? <laughs> yeah. So they they get her to say that she lit all these fires with matches in rooms full of people, and no one saw her do it. Have you ever tried to light a wall on fire? I haven't, but now okay. I'm. Uh... Okay, well, I have, uh, as a bit of a pyromaniac in my youth, we're going to say youth, and, you know, it takes a second. Like, it's really hard to just light the wallpaper on fire in most scenarios. (laughs) To be fair, I haven't tried to light 1948 wallpaper on fire. Maybe that's a little more flammable. Yeah. But then you would think it would just go up in flames, not do this little round circle that suddenly spreads until it goes into big flames. Yeah. It was, like not a delayed reaction fire she's an x-man yeah apparently they said she must have been awful slick to set all those fires over 200 of them without anyone spotting her awful <laughs> slick is in quotations yeah. Yeah. and there was no traces of like any like flammable liquids or accelerants found the family insists that, like, Juanette was an obedient, amicable girl, and that although she would prefer to have been in the city with her mother, she didn't have ill will towards the farm or the family. So, you know, it's an interesting story, and we don't know what's going on here. All right. Well, I've got a uh, story that's also smoke and fire related that is also totally unanswerable. <laughs> My story involves the Cora tree, uh, which uh, starts back in the 1700s. On Hatteras Island in North Carolina, there was the community of Frisco at the time, and a uh, slight woman and a baby, whom she was never seen without, arrived in this community. I mean, the woman was known. To- where would she have left her baby to like not be seen without her baby? I don't know. It's just yeah. I mean, she's by herself from what we get to in the story. She's completely alone, so I don't know why she wouldn't have her baby. I don't know, maybe they expected her to leave it while she was out gathering firewood or something. Can you do know. that? I mean, can I just, like, put Killian in the dog crate? Is that... Um, we grew up in the 80s and 90s, so you know darn well that you can just <laughs> leave a kid to their own devices. I don't like... think we were left alone as babies. Probably not. I don't know. I mean, remembers. I mean, like, maybe, like, while someone showered, but not, like, for... Not, like... Well, they went to the village to find flour. I I don't remember. I was very little at the time. Um, Fair. (laughs) So uh, this woman was known as Cora, and she uh, built herself a crude hut outside of town in the woods and mostly kept to herself. Her distance, both physically and socially, from the other villagers kind of served as a catalyst for rumors to quickly form and circulate about her and her possibly bastard child. Like I said, this is 1700, so the Salem witch trials were still fresh on the mind of most American settlers. So it didn't take long for the gossip about Cora to turn towards sorcery and witchcraft. Stories persisted that a cow she touched suddenly dried up and quit producing milk days later. 
A child that taunted and made faces at her suddenly became ill and died. And Cora always seemed to have an abundance of fish, even though the local fishermen were having trouble catching any themselves. So they just didn't like her because she was better at survival than they were? Like, she built her own huts without a man? I, you know, she could catch her own fish? Possible. Entirely possible, yeah. Fucking patriarchy. She is out there having it all, and they just couldn't take it. Anyway, these, these rumors might have stayed just that if it weren't for the arrival of a ship, the Susan G, and her captain, Eli Blood. Blood! Blood. This is a proper Robert Louis Stevenson type story here with Captain Blood. Hailing from Salem, Massachusetts, Blood considered himself a student of New England tradition, a defender of the people, and, naturally, a witch hunter. Uh, he immediately set to ingratiating himself to the townspeople and working his way in with the local hobnobbers and gossip hounds. Of course, after hearing of the town's troubles and of the suspicious Cora outside of town, Blood determined that she had to be the witch responsible for it all. This deal became particularly sealed when the body of a local man was found washed up on shore. His face was frozen in an expression of terror, and his hands were clasped together as though he were in prayer. Worst of all, the number 666 had been carved into his forehead. The most damning of all the evidence, though, ended up being a small collection of footprints around the body that had headed off in the woods towards Cora's hut. The development emboldened Captain Blood. He became sure that Cora was a witch and set out to prove it. He gathered an angry mob, marched over to Cora's hut, and they smashed their way inside, taking Cora and her baby prisoner. Out to prove her guilt, Blood pulled out his knife and performed his first test. As he suspected, her hair would not cut, and he announced, quote, Her hair was stronger than wire rope. Next, Cora's hands and feet were bound, but she floated in water regardless. So, she obviously weighed less than a duck, so right there, that's not looking good for her. Yeah. A witch! <laughs> in his final test, Blood filled a ceremonial witch hunter bowl with water, and placed a drop of blood, each from himself and three other men, into the water. He then, quote, stirred the water and blood vigorously, mixing it into a froth, end quote, and had the other men confirm that what he saw in the bowl was the face of Cora and the devil. Oh, well, you know what? I've never tried that test on anyone. Oh, I've that's... never seen or heard of a ceremonial <laughs> witch hunter bowl. <laughs> I want to know where you get one of those. How many we Cracker don't... Jack tops do you have to save for that? We we don't hunt witches in this family. Reminder. That's fair. I mean, unless we're just looking for people to hang out with. Yeah, well, Marion Stock. <laughs> Blood and his men tied Cora and her baby to an old oak tree and began gathering firewood to place around the base. Not only are they burning her, they're burning the baby. Yep. It was about this time some of the townspeople. Uh, led by a local captain, Thomas Smith, began to protest that Cora should be taken to the mainland and tried in a proper court of law. That's silly gooses. By the Scientologist judge. A argument ensued. Blood tried to light the fire himself, but Smith grabbed his arm, keeping his torch from the pyre. Blood shook loose from Smith's grasp, determined to burn his witch, when suddenly a bolt of lightning struck the tree. Huh. As the smoke cleared and the ringing of ears subsided, the people found that Cora and her baby had vanished. The ropes still hung wrapped around the tree, and the kindling sat at the base completely untouched. The trunk of the tree had been ripped open by the lightning, leaving a large, smoldering, heart-shaped hole. And where Cora and her baby had been tied to the tree were left letters burnt into the trunk. C-O-R-A. Cora. Thank you for pronouncing that for me. <laughs> Now, so that's a pretty cool story, right? The real tipper on this one, though, is that the Cora tree still exists to this day. And the word Cora is still visible on the trunk of the great tree. It stands on Hatteras Island in the middle of Snug Harbor Drive in Frisco. And, and I mean literally in the middle. They laid the road out so it splits in two around the tree and goes on either side of it. Well, I don't think they wanted to piss that tree off anymore. Well, probably not. <laughs> so this is, you know, I like to look into theories and plausibility on things. The tree itself, I've seen it attributed online as both being a southern live oak and a water oak. But 
at, from the photos of the tree and so photos So we know of, it's an oak. It is an oak. That that you can tell. I could tell that from the photos, but from the photos I couldn't tell which one it actually was. Like I said, I've seen people online claim both. Now, southern live oaks, they generally reach maturity around 70 years old, and so long as you put a carving on a tree after it reaches maturity, the carving will remain for the tree's lifespan. And there's examples of southern oaks in America that are over 900 years old. Hmm. Water oaks, on the other hand, they only live to be 100 or 150 years old, and they usually start to decay well before they reach 100 years. The Cora tree, there's been no known core sample taken of it to date it, but in 2009, LG Research estimated the tree to be about 500 years old based on its circumference. So hopefully it's the uh, southern, or otherwise everything falls apart right there. <laughs> I mean, it's a really, I'm looking at pictures right now, it's a really pretty tree. It's, I would like to hug it. It's very it. interesting. It's very interesting. <laughs> it's a hugging tree. <laughs> It also looks like it is in the middle of an HOA, so that's fun. The yeah, it is. That's that's something that came up <laughs> about it, which is kind of you know annoying, but so be it. The Cora carving itself has some eerie similarities to the Crow C R O carving from Roanoke Island and the Croatoan carving from Fort Rally. Well, I was thinking the Croatoan. Yeah, I thought yeah. the Croatoan was on Roanoke, is it not? There's those um, different legends that have kind of gotten merged together. I, it could be. Uh, what I read was that Crowton was on Rally and Crow was on Roanoke, but it could... You know that I've confused the stories on those so many times in the past, I just went with what I read most recently instead of trying to dig up the facts on that. All three carvings sit about five feet off the ground, and all of them are about four inches tall, and they all share a similar lettering design, which somebody made a point of in one article, but I don't know that... There's too many different ways to carve letters into a tree, yeah. so I don't know how important the typeface is on that. Also, they found some artifacts near Frisco that matched artifacts in the other locations, suggesting that those items were even cast from the same uh, mold and dye. Now, neither the Captains nor the Susan G. show up in any historical records. Interestingly, the name Cora wasn't common in America until the mid 1800s, um, hmm. after the publishing of *The Last of the Mohicans*, because hmm. one of the characters' daughters was named Cora in that. Cora with a K was a common name in 1700s Germany, so there is a prospect of Cora being an immigrant, unfamiliar with a common language in the nearby village, and that would certainly explain why she was so distant and alien to the rest of the townsfolk. The details of this whole event change, event change wildly depending on the attitude of the storyteller, I noticed. Those looking to condemn Korra tended to embellish the witchy aspects of the story. It's not uncommon for the story to mention that the baby transformed into a black cat with green eyes and ran away into the woods before the lightning struck. Hmm. Then there's retellings by more sympathetic orators that like to make note of blood having kind of a boastful, egotistical personality, which would, you know, kind of fits in with him being, I'm from Massachusetts and I know all these things. And I have a witch hunter's bowl. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly, right? And the suspiciousness of his crew as they stayed away from town and placed themselves in positions to help sell more of the sordid details of blood story, like... Like, the the thing about finding the body washed ashore, they wanted to blame that on Cora, based on footprints they found near the body, but why would she be near the body after it washed ashore if she was responsible for killing it? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> also of note is that, like I said, this is a North Carolina tale that has a hot-headed Massachusetts man be the one thirsty for blood, while the cool-headed hospitality-focused Southerners were all trying to push for civility and proper legal procedure, which is something I've seen in, in you know, it is kind of a motif I've seen in a few different stories from the South. Uh, whatever the case, the tree, like I say, still exists. The Cora carving is still visible even to this day, well enough that you can even see it in photographs, and it's a living reminder that mystery and wonder still exist in our world. Okay. So we talked about some smoky ghosts. We got some smoky ghosts. Do we got a smoky drink? We do. 
we're calling this baby the Macomb, Macomb, however we decided to pronounce this oh, show. Macomb, Macomb. I think I was saying Macomb, Macomb or Macomb. Anyway, Macomb Smoke Show. Yeah. All right. So essentially what we're doing here is a smoked rosemary gimlet. Mm -hmm. So a gimlet is a, a super classic cocktail. It's basically lime juice and gin. People make them with vodka too, but I don't believe in that. <laughs> I mean, I think it's fine. I just don't like it as much because I like gin. That doesn't mean I don't like vodka. Vodka is not the catch-all replacement for everything that people like to treat it as. I mean, it, it serves its purpose, especially when I'm dieting. I'm definitely a vodka drinker when I'm dieting. Okay, that's fair. Vodka soda, a lot of lemon. The diet drink is a vodka lemon with chili pepper and soy sauce and maple syrup, right? That's the... There's no soy sauce in the drink, in, in the fire cider you're thinking of, but... Uh... No, I was thinking of the, uh, what is that, the Long Beach 48 hour or whatever or something like that? Oh, yeah, no, that's... But it's basically, it's the same thing. Well, it's very similar to fire cider, so, oh, okay. you know, it would... That's usually like filtered water, lemon, cayenne, pepper. I want to say there's one more thing in it, but it's definitely not soy sauce. No, maple syrup is one that I've read. Maple syrup, that's yeah. what it is. Organic maple syrup. <laughs> anyway, so there's a few ways we can go about smoking a cocktail. If you're really fancy, you can get a smoke gun, which I might invest in in the future. You can use it for other culinary uses. And I think you can get those for like 30 bucks for like on Amazon up to like a couple hundred bucks. But then yeah. you just like shoot some smoke into your drink. I've got a couple of smoke machines for the theater. We could, uh, I believe that's not quite the same, but I mean, <laughs> it could be useful for something poisoning someone. I did smoke out the entire street for Halloween last year. So I feel like we could kill someone with a few smoke machines and some cocktails if need be. <laughs> you can also smoke the glass. So you can, Tip your glass upside down and use it to cover a small fire of your choosing. You can use like a cedar plank with a little fire in the middle. You can light an herb or some like wood chips on fire. Put your glass over it so the glass just kind of gets a smoke coating. I assume that would smother the fire pretty quickly too. Usually, and you typically want to use a tempered glass for that and just make sure it's for <laughs> a smolder, not an actual fire. You can also, like, do the same concept with a tempered glass. Like, drop your flaming herb into this. Sounds like we're smoking weed. Drop your flaming herb into the bottom of the tempered glass. Mm -hmm. Let it smolder for a second and then dump your drink on top. That works a little better if you've, like, spritzed your herb with alcohol. So, like, green chartreuse, I believe, is a good alcohol option for the spritz method. You can also use, like, 151. There's a yeah. reason uh -huh. making a Spanish coffee is one of my favorite cocktails to make, and it's strictly because you get to light the glass on fire. <laughs> it's an important step in bartending for me. Uh, and you can also, another option would be to make a smoke-infused simple syrup where you would throw the smoking herb into the syrup while you're making it. So I'm sure there's other things you could do. I know you can get into, like, washes and shrubs and things that... Uh, are a little out of my element, but maybe I'll start getting into that. Is there much difference in the smoky after effects between these different methods, or are they all fairly close? I mean, I'm going to be honest, I haven't side-by-side -side tried all of these methods, but I think they're going to give you at least a similar option. Like yeah. Some of them, I'm sure, will be a little bit smokier than others. You could always use liquid smoke, too, if you just really want to get... Um, Ew. Can I please get a martini, four olives, and some liquid smoke? And I just want to point out that you're talking about smoking glass and smoking drinks, and I didn't make any jokes about how hard those would be to light. But um bum Nick was smoking something. Something just that something. stopped the dad joke. So you're going to put that recipe together, figure out which smoke method you want to pass along? Yes, we will We will figure out which smoke method is best. I'll probably include some notes on all of them, just in case you're feeling experimental. Maybe that could be a bartending tip video. Ooh, you know what? We have a Patreon now. I was going to get to that as we approach the end of the show. The promises were made have come true. We do have our, our Patreon page that we kept threatening during the Christmas episode. We've got like some extra clips that end up on the cutting room floor, but I particularly enjoyed. We've got early access to episodes. That early access is really dependent on 
how fast we get the episode together. Sometimes we have the episode together weeks ahead of time, and sometimes we're struggling to get it out just before the deadline. Called did Kate have her shit together that day? <laughs> uh, we've got stickers coming. We do have stickers coming. That's going to be and and that's going to be any of the Patreon tiers for the first month. We'll send you our booze and spirit sticker pack. We'll kind of give you a, a look at those on Instagram when they arrive. And we'll also have some other ways to get the sticker packs later if Patreon's not exactly your bag. We're not above a bribe. We've got uncut recordings, or, or, or rough cut recording, I guess. They're not really uncut, because sometimes there's stuff that, you know, we'll name names or, or something that just shouldn't belong on tape, and we'll, we'll cut that out. But they're, they're basically the rough versions of the recordings that Kate and I make when we're making the episodes, which, if that's something you're interested in there it is it's it's usually pretty hard to listen to before i get to editing it it's usually the part where kate makes the really offensive statements which she's been uh she's been trying to self-monitor but you know she drinks a lot when we make these shows so <laughs> sometimes it's easier than others and then we're also we're, we've got some plans for uh future video content and that video content will in make its way to our youtube but we'll have early access to those through the patreon as well and if you are really into it we've got i mean we we made some gags about feet pics so we put that in there we made some gags about giving us a million dollars for a mansion we put that in there he says gags (laughs) i'm serious you got money i got feet pics (laughs) and we've also got some tears out there so you can pick a segment or or join a recording with us if that's the kind of thing that you'd like to do and i'm sure we will evolve our patreon as our followers hopefully grow idealistically yeah someday we'll have like you know shirts or leg warmers i don't know i would like to do more series of stickers but you know i don't want to promise anything before that's something we know we can pull off so so for right now it's just the stickers for your first month subscription and we'll see what we can put together after that we've got stickers made they're pictures of nick feet pick so you know <laughs> they're real nice i blurred out the toenails though because i'm not a whore i can get you some of sean's feet pics his feet are real gross <laughs> so can we get scratch and sniff sean feet pick i don't know i didn't look into scratch and sniff stickers i don't know who does that we might have to make those ourselves i'm sure there's a tutorial somewhere online we'll just uh make some essential oil out of sean's feet stink oh. <laughs> 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 and we will need a new uh, computer for, from our Patreon funds because Katie just barfed all over hers. <laughs> I love the man, but something is really wrong with his feet. <laughs> um, I think next episode, I want to do Swamp Ghosts because I've already got one lined up for that. And I think it's kind of easy for you to dig up. Uh, so my drink's going to consist of mud. I might do Swamp Margarita. Let's do Swamp Ghosts. We're going to do Swamp Ghosts next time. Can I do Swamp Witches? Because really, that's my dream job. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to be a Swamp Witch when I grow up. <laughs> Remember to check out our show notes. That's where we have information about this episode. I'll try to remember to throw in some photos of the Cora Tree. Ooh, we can get you a picture of Juanette, and you can not sleep that night. You can listen to our podcast and all the usual suspects. Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify. Our website is boozeandspirits.com. We are on the YouTubes at Booze Spirits, B-O-O-S Spirits. Instagram, Facebook, all those links are on our website, boozeandspirits.com. Patreon. The link for Patreon is there. The Patreon is patreon.com slash booze spirits podcast. Um, yeah, so always drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost. So if you like us, please rate, review, subscribe on your podcast provider of your choice. Podcast for forever. Give strike that. Do those words at the end? Nope. Definitely not. Don't strike. <laughs> All right. I think mean, that's a sign we should leave. <laughs> Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> We're good at this. Bye.